Now, God's ways are far above man's ways. And it is for that reason that it is wise for men to avoid being dogmatic about the providential operations of Almighty God. There are cases, however, where there are so many coincidences that we may be justified in tentatively suggesting that God has overseen and influenced developments. The emergence, for example, of the Dead Sea Scrolls in the 20th century may be such a case. The discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls is the most significant development in biblical archaeology and textual studies in modern times. Most Bible students are aware of the story of the discovery by a Bedouin shepherd boy of ancient Hebrew scrolls in a cave near the Dead Sea. This led to a search of nearby caves which unearthed a total of seven scrolls and a vast number of fragments of other ancient writings. The scrolls had been preserved in fragile earthenware jars and had lain undisturbed for nearly 2,000 years. We will see that the scrolls came to light at exactly the time when the state of Israel was being established. Having laid undisturbed in isolated caves for nearly 19 centuries, their discovery at that time served to reinforce the fact that God's plan and purpose with the descendants of Abraham, as documented in some of these scrolls, was being fulfilled by divine oversight. Now, late in 1947, the first scrolls discovered came into the possession of two dealers in iniquities, located in Bethlehem. A professor of archaeology at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, Eliezer Sekenik, became aware of three of these scrolls and decided that they should be purchased by a Jewish institution, but... These were the closing days of the British mandate in Palestine and to stem intercommunal violence the area around Jerusalem had been divided into separate military zones. Movement between the zones required special permits. Sir Kenick managed to secure a permit to travel on the 29th of November in 1947. He boarded an Arab bus for the trip to, from Jerusalem to Bethlehem. He was the only Jew in the bus and tensions were running high as this was the day on which the United Nations General Assembly was to vote on a motion to partition Palestine, allowing for the creation of Arab and Jewish states. Acquiring two of the scrolls, he returned to Jerusalem. That night, Sukenik was examining these remarkable documents when news came through that the United Nations had supported the partition motion. Had Sir Kenick delayed his journey even by one day, he may not have been able to purchase these scrolls. Having secured two of the three scrolls, he was able to acquire the third scroll a week later. <laughs> Sir Kenick's son was Yigael Yadin, arguably Israel's most illustrious archaeologist. In a book published in 1957, Yadin made this observation. I cannot avoid the feeling that there is something symbolic in the discovery of these scrolls and their acquisition at the moment of the creation of the State of Israel. It's as if these manuscripts had been waiting in caves for 2,000 years ever since the destruction of Israel's independence until the people of Israel had returned to their home and regained their freedom. This symbolism is highlight highlighted by the fact that the first three, two in fact, scrolls were bought by my father for Israel on the 29th of November in 1947, the very day on which the United Nations voted for the recreation of the Jewish state after 2,000 years. There were other scrolls than these three acquired by Sir Kenick. Earlier in 1947, four scrolls, including the famous Isaiah scrolls, had been acquired by Archbishop Mar Samuel of the Syrian Orthodox Church. 
based in the old city of Jerusalem. In January 1948, these scrolls were shown to Sir Kenick, who recognised immediately that they were from the same hoard as the two he had already secured. He offered to purchase the four scrolls for £2,000 sterling. In the fraught military and political environment prevailing at that time, he was unable to secure the funds and the sale fell through. To find out more about the scrolls held by the church, a colleague of the Archbishop consulted an archaeologist based in the American School of Oriental Research in Jerusalem. He photographed the scrolls, which was a feat as it was extremely difficult to secure film in the chaotic conditions in Jerusalem in early 1948. Having eventually obtained enough film, he sent the photographs to the leading biblical archaeologist. Having, having eventually obtained enough film, he sent the photographs to the leading biblical archaeologist and Semitic epigrapher at the time, William Foxwell Albright, at John Hopkins University in Baltimore in the United States of America. Albright examined the photographs and sent the following message, which arrived at the American School of the Oriental Research in Jerusalem on the 15th of May 1948, the day after the State of Israel was proclaimed. My heartiest congratulations on the greatest manuscript discovery of modern times. There is no doubt in my mind that the script is more archaic than that of the Nash Pyrus. I, would, I should prefer a date of around 100 BC. What an absolutely incredible find and there can happily not be the slightest doubt in the world about the genuineness of the manuscripts. Due to the Israeli War of Independence, two weeks after receiving this remarkable confirmation, the American School of Oriental Research was obliged to close and its American scholars returned to the USA. Concerned about the risk to the scrolls posed by the war, Archbishop Ma Samuels sent them to Beirut for safety. In January 1949, he travelled to the USA with the scrolls in the hope of finding a buyer for them to generate publicity. The scrolls were displayed in a range of prestigious locations across the USA, but curiously, no institution was willing to make an offer to purchase them. Archbishop Mar Samuel eventually settled permanently in New Jersey after more than four years waiting for a buyer. He became desperate and on the 1st of June in 1954 inserted a classified advertisement in the Wall Street Journal inviting offers for the scrolls. Yigel Yadin was in the USA at the time and his attention was drawn to the advertisement. He determined that they must be secured for Israel but knew the Archbishop was unlikely to be willing to sell them to the Jewish state. Yadin arranged for an intermediary to negotiate on his behalf and agreement was reached to pay $250,000 for the scrolls. The negotiator acting on Yadin's behalf, however, was not competent to authenticate the scrolls and Yadin, who was competent to do so, was known to the Archbishop. So yet another go-between was needed to confirm the genuineness of the scrolls. A friend of Yadin, Harry Orlinsky, of the John Hopkins University, agreed to take on the task. Now, it was quite fortuitous that they were able to secure his assistance because Mr Orlinsky was actually in the process of locking the door of his home before leaving on vacation when they telephoned him to ask for his assistance. A mere minute later and they would have missed him. Although reluctant to postpone his vacation, he and his wife concluded that the sacrifice was appropriate and they could assist the Jewish state. Orlinsky agreed to perform the task as a matter of urgency. Instead of going on a vacation, Orlinsky travelled to, to New York and, assuming the name Mr Green, inspected the skulls in a, a bank vault in the basement of the Waldorf Astoria Hotel. Now, having authenticated the scrolls, he went to a public phone, called an unlisted number and uttered the code word Kyayim, which means to life, to confirm his positive conclusion. The transaction was completed and the scrolls handed over to the new owner. 
the scrolls were flown to Israel one at a time, and on the 13th of February in 1955, Israel's Prime Minister, Moshat Sharet, called a press conference to announce that all seven scrolls were now in Israel's hands. This made headline news around the world. How was it that Israel could acquire these four scrolls for such a modest price? In 1933, at the height of the Great Depression, the British Museum paid £100,000, equivalent at the time to about $355,000, for the Codex Sinaiticus. At about the same time that Yadin purchased these four scrolls, Yale University paid $50,000 for a first edition of Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. At $250,000, the four scrolls were a bargain. This why was the covert Israel offer the only serious offer made in response to the Archbishop's advertisement? Yagel Yadin ascribed the lack of credible offers to the false values of the market value for rare books in the United States. This explanation does not sound credible and it would seem that other forces, perhaps divinely influenced, were at work. The caves where the scrolls were discovered are in the West Bank. During the Israeli War of Independence, Jordan conquered this area and the old city of Jerusalem. The Archbishop had smuggled the scrolls out of the old city after it fell into Jordanian hands. Jordan claimed title to the scrolls as they, as they had been found in what it regarded in 1954 as its own territory. As Jordan had publicly asserted its claims to the scrolls, any prospective purchaser, purchaser, a university or a national library, for instance, would have been concerned about the risk of legal action being taken by Jordan seeking the returns of the scrolls. This would have worried institutions in every nation other than Israel, which at the time was still technically at war with Jordan. Jordan would have had to recognise Israel if it wished to sue for the return of the scrolls. That could not be countenanced. Thus it was that Israel was one of the very few, perhaps the only prospective purchasers, purchasers willing to be able to complete the transaction. A lack of competition also kept the price low for a, a, a cash-strapped Jewish state. Discovery of the initial scrolls in the 1940s sparked a search of other caves of, in the vicinity by official archaeologists <coughs> under the leadership of G. Lancaster Harding, head of the Jordanian Iniquities Department, which began in January 1949 after the War of Independence as possible. The famous Copper Scroll was discovered in 1952 and sent to a museum in Amman in Jordan but mostly all that was found were fragments of scrolls which had not survived intact. Bedouin tribesmen also continued searching the caves in the hope of finding material they could sell on the antiquities market. Even though the Bedouin were acting as looters and trading in their finds arguably was illegal, Harding decided to purchase as much as he could from the dealers acting on behalf of the Bedouin. In addition to being head of the Jordanian Department of Antiquities, Harding was curator of the Palestine Archaeological Museum, the PAM, known, now known as the Rockefeller Museum in Jerusalem. Instead of assigning the material, he purchased from the dealers to the Jordanian Government Museum in Amman. Harding arranged for the material to be deposited in the PAM. Eventually, Thousands of fragments were in the custody of the PAM and during the 1956 Sinai War the Jordanian government became concerned that the PAM might fall into Israeli hands. As a precaution the fragments were packed up and relocated to Amman. After hostilities ceased the material was returned to the PAM in Jerusalem. In 1956 Bedouin tribesmen found a further cache of scrolls. It is not clear how many they found because rather than handing them over to archaeological institutions, these scrolls were also sold to antiquity dealers. 
It is known, however, that they found at least three scrolls and numerous fragments of scrolls. By 1961, the Jordanian government aggrieved that so much of the material being unearthed in these caves was being dispersed to foreign purchasers, nationalised the scrolls. This meant that Jordan did not recognise private ownership of the looted material. In a further bid to ensure its control of the material, in 1966, Jordan nationalised the PAM. When hostilities broke out between Israel and Jordan in 1967, the Jordanians did not relocate the scroll fragments to Amman as they had done in 1956. Instead, they merely moved them to the safety of the basement of the PAM. The curious decision meant that when Israel seized the old city of Jerusalem early in the Six Day War, both the museum and its contents became Israel's property. Had Harding decided to deposit the Dead Sea Scroll related material in the museum at Amman, or if the Jordanians had moved the material to Amman as they had done in 1956, it would not have come under the control of Israel in 1967. The most recent of the Dead Sea Scrolls to come to light is known as the Temple Scroll. This is one of the scrolls discovered by Bedouin tribesmen in 1956. It had long been suspected that antiquities dealers in Bethlehem named Kando was hiding a significant scroll from the caves. Bethlehem fell to Israeli forces early in the Six Day War. On the third day of the war, even while fighting was still raging in many areas, Yigal Yadin sent an Israeli colonel to confront Kando about the hidden scroll. Kando produced the scroll and it was immediately confiscated. Later he was paid $105,000 for the scroll, but it was now in Israeli hands. As an outcome of the Six Day War, in 1967, Israel came to control most of the scrolls that have so far been discovered. The only exception is the Copper Scroll. Israel built an impressive museum, the Shrine of the Book, to house the scrolls. They are national treasures, documents which confirm the accuracy of the text of the Bible as it has come down to us over the centuries. The search for more scrolls continues to this day. Earlier this year it was announced that another cave had been found where scrolls had been deposited in ancient times. Unfortunately, that cave had already been looted, presumably by the Bedouins searching for antiquities to sell in the 1950s. Who knows? This may be the cave from which the temple scroll was looted. Why did Harding decide to concentrate the scroll-related material in a museum? in Jerusalem rather than one in the capital of the country for which he worked. After all, the Copper Scroll was sent to Amman rather than Jerusalem. Why had Kando waited so long to sell such a valuable item? Perhaps he was hoping that holding back the scroll was to boost its value. Why did Jordan not move its scroll-related material from Jerusalem to Amman when war broke out in 1967? as it had in 1956. No doubt there is a natural explanation. It is at least curious that all these decisions by people who had little sympathy for the Jewish state have ensured that today so much of this material is in Israeli hands. So many significant dates and so many curious decisions came together in this story we may not be able to say for certain that God overtly manipulated all these events, but it is at least reasonable to suggest that God's hand may well have been behind at least some of these developments. There is good reason to think that there was divine oversight in the preservation and the discovery of the scrolls. The scrolls came to light at exactly the time when the State of Israel was being established, having laid undisturbed in isolated caves for nearly 19 centuries. Their discovery at that time served to reinforce the fact that God's plan and purpose with the descendants of Abraham, as documented in some of these scrolls, was being fulfilled by divine oversight.